And, uh, you know, we get there as an element of surprise at nighttime and boom, you kick, you hear the, the doors get kicked down and the dogs sniffing around the IED detectors going off and nothing's there. So, you know, we stabilize our, our, uh, our units overnight and I go on the rooftop with, uh, with my team and I tell them guys, just stay put. I'm going to go down and get the rest of the equipment and I'll be right back. And before you know it, you know, I jump off the roof down to the ground, which is like a five foot drop. And all of a sudden I'm just looking up at the sky and I just hear, you know, kind of like that pin drop. You know, it's almost like your eardrums are busted out and I'm just seeing little flickering lights everywhere. And I hear, you know, don't move, look for secondaries. And I'm just like, what the hell's going on? You know, and all of a sudden, bam, it hits me like a bus. Hey guys, check out the 2023 Street Cop Conference, April 23rd through the 28th, Gaylord Convention Center. It's going to be the event of the year. Keynote speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Medal of Honor recipient, Navy SEAL Jason Redman, Fox News host Tommy Lahren, Marine Corps Special Forces and Leadership Coach Cody Alford, Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff David Clark, and Sheriff Mark Lamb. It's going to be one hell of an event. And on top of that, we have all of our instructors and additional instructors from other companies going to be at the event, giving you everything they know for you to have a successful career and get the results you want to get in the field as a police officer. On top of attending the event, you'll get face-to-face -face time with every instructor attending the event, and all the keynote speakers will spend time with you. we got special events all week, giveaways, nightlife. It's going to be really, really worth your time, energy, and effort. I promise you, you will not regret it for a second. To register for the conference, check out streetcop.com, click conference, and everything you need will be there on the homepage. If you are looking for a room, just click book a room. The block has been sold out at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center but there are many hotels nearby within a walking distance of the event. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. We will see you there. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino. We have a very special guest today. It's funny, dude. I... Never imagined having you on my podcast, but I remember watching the news, reading the articles. Real cool fucking story. I can't wait for you to tell it. Matthias Ferreira. That's how you say it, right? Yeah, Matthias. Close it up. Matthias. Well, I know Mate there's no EO, dude. I'm fucking it up, right? That's that Italian I say Hispanic. crossover. I say Hispanic. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My bad, dude. My bad. I got the last name right, though, Good. Ferreira. People are like yeah. Fieriera, right? They fuck it up all the time. No, nah, you got it all point. So he's well known for being a double amputee police officer. So, dude, why don't you give us a little background and history uh, of your life, where you grew up? Obviously, you're a bro from Long Island. And, uh, you know, we're from Jersey, so it's kind of cut from the same cloth over here. Give us the skinny on who you are, man. Yeah, no problem, man. I appreciate it. I thank you uh, for having me on the show and, you know, letting me tell my story. Um, you know, it's been an interesting uh, last couple of years. You know, I... Uh, I was born in a very small country in South America, Uruguay. It's right under Brazil. And um, my family wanted to move to the United States to pursue the American dream. My mom's brother lived in Atlanta, Georgia. They wanted to come and visit. And, uh, and we took a little visit in 1995 um, to visit family. And my family fell in love with it. So they wanted to move up and, and basically show us a different type of life, you know, a life away from poverty, a life away from, you know, the, the, the streets and, and everything else. So um, we came up in, in 1996 for the Olympics, the Atlanta Olympics. And again, my family fell in love and enrolled us in school. We got the visas and all that good stuff and uh, started learning the language and really just a whole new you know, meaning of what, what freedom was in life. And, you know, kids running around and playing outside and not having to worry about getting mugged or any of that, you know. So through the years, we're going to school, my brothers and I, I have an older brother and a younger brother. And we're all talking about what we want to do when we grow up, you know, and as, as at that age, seven, eight, nine years old, everybody wants to be a pilot or a lawyer or a doctor or, or a cop or something along those lines. And I remember meeting a man in uniform. He's in dress blues uh, at the Olympics. And, you know, he's all decked out with medals and rank structure and everything. And I was like, dad, I want to be like that cop one day. And my dad looks at me and he goes, well, he's not a cop. He's a Marine. And so I kind of just kept that, that vision in my head. And as I'm growing up, you know, 9-11 happens and at the time, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, so it didn't quite impact me like the rest of my friends um, that are from here, which is funny how I ended up in New York. And so now the war breaks off and I'm getting ready to graduate high school. And, you know, I was an athlete. I played, I played football and baseball. I wrestled. And um, at, at one point, I was decent enough to get some scholarships to some uh, lower end colleges. And I just told my parents, I, like, I want to go. I want to go to, you know, to the Marines. 
And my mom, of course, like any other mom was worried and uh, didn't really want me doing that. So, you know, I kept working and, and looking forward to graduating. And my older brother wanted to be a teacher. My younger brother wanted to be a doctor. And I just wanted to leave. And I wanted to go fight the war and pretty much just represent our last name and, uh, and give something back to a country that had given my family so much uh, and our freedom. So I listened to the United States Marine Corps upon graduating high school. And I entered into a contract with open infantry, meaning, you know, whatever I ended up graduating as, whether it was a machine gunner or a mortarman or something like that, that's the path that would take. So now, you know, war breaks off and I'm looking back and, you know, I go through boot camp and graduate boot camp, go to SOI, which is School of Infantry. And I get assigned the MOS, which is the military occupation skill of machine gunner. And uh, then we go to our unit, which I was attached to 1st Battalion, 8th Marines out of Lejeune in North Carolina. And, uh, and we get there and they tell us, well, you guys are going to be deployed to Afghanistan in like seven months. And I'm like looking around like, what the hell? We're going to Afghanistan. I don't even know how to shoot this damn gun yet. And uh, less alone how to fight a war against an enemy who's been fighting for centuries. And so now we go through the training and the bullshit. We go to California. We do all, uh, you know, firing ranges and ID lanes and all the stuff that you do to prep to go to, to a deployment. And uh, I look back and I'm, you know, 19, 19, 20 years old. And I'm walking the streets of Afghanistan in September of 2010 and uh, pretty surreal at the time. You know, the weeks start passing by and we're taking small arm fire. And before you know, it, we take our first casualty. And then, you know, a couple of weeks pass by. We take our second and third and fourth and fifth. You know, we're losing guys left and right. You know, the IEDs are going off everywhere. You know, so now we get to an observation post where all my machine gunners and the rest of my squad were at. And we were going to do a, a reconnaissance mission overnight. So we're going to take the elements in. And basically go over a wadi, which is an open land of water, and uh, and overtake this compound, which was known to have uh, IEDs and Taliban, you know, working out of there. And uh, you know, we get there as an element of surprise at nighttime, and boom, you kick, you hear the, the doors get kicked down, and the dogs sniffing around, the IED detectors going off, and nothing's there. So you know, we stabilize our our uh, our units overnight, and I go on the rooftop with uh, with my team, and I tell them guys, just stay put. I'm going to go down and get the rest of the equipment and I'll be right back. And before you know it, you know, I jump off the roof down to the ground, which is like a five foot drop. And all of a sudden I'm just looking up at the sky and I just hear, you know, kind of like that pin drop, you know, it's almost like your eardrums are busted out and I'm just seeing little flickering lights everywhere. And I hear, you know, don't move, look for secondaries. And I'm just like, what the hell's going on? You know, and all of a sudden, bam, it hits me like a bus, you know? And uh, I look around and I just look down and I see that there's blood all over my pants and you know, my doc, my, which is my Navy corpsman, runs up to me. He's like, dude, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. And he starts putting tourniquets on one leg. And I'm kind of helping him with the other one, not knowing the severity of my injury, because I, I didn't even know an IED went off at that point. And, um, and I can't really move uh, to left and right because I felt like my body was numb. And I was like, man, am I paralyzed? Did I break my leg? I mean, I've never had a serious injury before um, this evening. And, you know, all I hear in the background is just uh, Bravo, Mike, Foxtrot, 7 2 2 9 and they're calling in the nine-line medevac. Uh, to get the helicopter in. And, um, you know, the, the helicopter luckily was in the in the area because of the operation we were running. And then I just realized, bam, I, ha I hit an IED. Um, so now the guys are all crying. And, you know, I'm like, hey, knock it the fuck off. You know, like, we're going to be all right. We're going to be OK. And I just kind of keep going in and out. And you hear the helicopter landing and this LZ in the middle of the frigging desert. And the guys kind of pick me up in the litter and take me over. And all I remember from that point is just you know, the, the M4 keeps slapping me in the face from the guys running to the bird. I'm just kind of like trying to swat away the, the rifle. And I'm looking at one of my guys. I'm like, hey, fucking move, you know. And uh, and I, I just kind of feel them putting me up on the helicopter. And this is kind of where they knew that I was going to be all right. When, you know, the guys are like give me a thumbs up, like, hey, soldier, you're going home. And I'm like, I'm not a soldier. I'm a fucking Marine. You know, and we have like that pride in us, you know, where, you know, Coast Guard people are Coasties. You know, Airmen are Air Force. Uh, Navy seamen, you know, they, we all have our, our terminology. So they kind of got a kick out of that. And uh, then the morphine started to kick in and I'm kind of like hallucinating and I'm like seeing aliens on both sides of me and I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And when I came to, I realized it was the night vision goggles that were reflecting off the medics eyeballs, you know, so they're just kind of laughing. And, and then at that point, you know, the meds kind of kicked in and I knocked out and wake up at a small uh, hospital uh, in Bargram. And then from there, they kind of, you know, make sure that I was stabilized. And then they shipped me off to launch tool Germany. And, you know, here we are today, you know, 12 years later. Yeah. I think you're missing a few minor details in there. Uh, <laughs> I'm, missing a, I'm, I'm missing a few. I'm missing a few. I didn't know if you had any questions, you know, so now 
Of course. I'm, yeah. I'm here's my through. question. Here's my question, uh, Mateus. How the fuck did you lose your legs? Yeah. And when did they make the decision to take them? Yeah. So the when the bomb went off, you know, when the ID had uh, had gone off, both legs were you know already amputated. So both my feet were already gone. Um, and then you know, obviously, when I got to the hospital and they started the emergency surgeries, they had to you know amputate a little higher just to take uh, some of the infection out and 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 the bone that was protruding through the skin. Um, I broke my pelvis, shattered my femur. I uh, had shrapnel throughout, you know, both my legs and, and my upper body. And that was very fortunate, you know, that I didn't have anything to my hands or my eyes or anything, um, you know, because of the gear that I was wearing. So, you know, once we got back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in, in Washington, D.C., that's kind of where we began the rehabilitation. But I wasn't really able to start walking um, until about three and a half months in because of the broken pelvis that had to kind of heal on its own. So, you know, you look around at the MATC, which is the Military Events Training Center, that's where all the guys are doing rehabilitation and learning how to walk and run and everything again. And you're kind of getting motivated by all the guys and girls around you. And, um, you know, I meet this kid named Josh Weggy. He's a double amputee Marine, little redheaded kid from uh, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And uh, he's like, hey, man, you know, uh, my name's Josh. And he's wearing jeans at the time and a shirt. And he comes to the room. You know, we do that whole peer uh, mediation thing where we try to kind of hype each other up and motivate one another. And uh, he just explained it to me, like, what he's doing and how he's playing sports and, you know, he's running. And I'm kind of like, hey, asshole, I don't know if you know, but I lost both my fucking legs in Afghanistan. He's like, oh, I forgot to tell you, you know, he pulls up his pants legs and, you know, he's an amputee, but you would have never known. You know, you would have never known the way he walked in and his confidence and, you know, everything else he had going for him. So he's telling me about this amputee softball team that was traveling at the time. Um, and, and they wanted me to come out and try out for the team. And he's like, I know you're not really ready for that right now. But from what we hear, you're a very athletic guy and, and we want to get you back into sports, you know, adaptive sports. And all I could think about is, man, I, I know that some people are, um, you know, uh, wheelchair users and, and, and unable to stand up because of their circumstances. But I want to get I want to get back to running. I want to get back and doing everything that I used to do before my injury. So um, obviously, the time progresses and now I start traveling on this softball team, which is all amputees from different uh, branches of service. And everybody's missing either an arm, a leg, both legs, uh, eyesight. And, uh, and this team's really good. All the players played at a collegiate level. They played in college. They played travel. They played competitive. Um, so now we're traveling to like 37 states in two years and playing in Hawaii, New York, Florida, Texas, California. I mean, you name it, Alaska. Uh, I mean, they've, they've even been playing overseas. And, uh, and with this team, what that enabled me to do was a lot of the supporters that came out to watch the team were – either military service members or veterans uh, and law enforcement first responders. So I just remember kind of looking at, you know, the cops and, you know, them giving us our escorts and stuff. And a lot of the guys were like, man, why don't you're young? Why don't you try to be a cop? And I was like, man, I've never seen it. I've never, I've Googled it. You know, I've looked all over the internet looking for amputees. And a lot of the guys that I got feedback were injured either on the job and on the desk, or they were a below the knee amputee, which, you know, changes the game a little bit if you're a single or double. And, uh, and I was like, I, I don't really know. You know, I don't really know how to even start. So um, living on Long Island, you know, in, in Suffolk County, I end up traveling with this team and uh, I end up moving to New York. And uh, I have a cousin on the job and he's like, hey, man, why don't you take the test and see where it goes for Suffolk County Police Department in, uh, in Suffolk County, New York? And I said, all right, what do I got to lose? You know, I'll take the written and see what, what happens. And surprisingly, being a Marine, everybody that, you know, listens to this story, they're like, I, I don't know how you did that. But, you know, I, I scored high enough on the, on the test. Um, that would enable me to, to push through the process and go to the physical and the psych and the polygraph and all that, the medical. And I knew that, okay, I passed the, the written exam, but now all those other challenges were about to be like, all right, you know, Hey man, you got no legs. You're not going to be able to be a cop. And, uh, actually on the contrary, I was quite opposite. When I went there to do my medical, the doctors were like, do you have a, a note that says that you're, you know, physically and able to do, uh, the police you know, officer duties. And I go, I can get whatever you need. So my doctor wrote a form and, and knew that I was competing on many different levels in different sports and saying that I was fit for duty. And so, of course, they let me take my written, uh, my, my physical, and, and I kind of keep moving through the process. And I'm like, there's no fucking way they're going to hire me. You know, in the back of my mind, I was working at the time. I was going to college. I was a steam fitter for a local 638 in the city. Uh, I was hanging upside down, welding and cutting and all sorts of stuff going up and down, you know, stairs all day. And, um, and all of a sudden, one day, I'm, I'm on my way home from work. And I'm driving with my boss because we commute from the city back to Long Island. And I get this call and it's like Suffolk County, you know, uh, civil service or something. So I answer the phone. I'm like, hey, how are you? This is Matias. And they go, hey, how are you doing? This is Suffolk County Police. 
uh, your, your investigator, we just want to know, are you still interested in being a police officer? And I go, absolutely. Yes, sir. And he goes, all right, you start Monday morning. And it's like Friday afternoon. So I'm oh, kind of like, I'm like so much of this two weeks notice, you know? So I got to go home. I got to get my shit ready, my paperwork in, in order. I got to go to headquarters. I got to go to quartermaster, get my uniforms and all sorts of stuff. And I just remember it's almost like being back in boot camp. I was excited. I went to shave my head because I was like, I already know the game. And I'm not going to show up to work like this. Uh, shave face, you know, clean cut. I'm in my suit. And, uh, and of course, I show up on Monday morning, you know, to do the whole process as a police officer. And here we go again. You know, it's like, what the hell did I sign up for? You got the drill instructors yelling at you and screaming in your position of attention. So um, when a lot of people ask about the, the, the difference and the similarities of police and law, enfor uh, law enforcement and, and military is very, very different, actually. You know, the only similarity is, you know, obviously, you know that there's a chain of command. You know that you're going to be talking louder because you're using your command voice. You're doing what's called double time, which you're moving with a purpose. Like all that stuff was very similar. But when it came down to uh, the camaraderie, you know, it's, it's a little different. You know, we work in single car operating vehicles. You know, we're not always doubled up like the, the city or a lot of other departments where you're riding double. So a lot of times you would be working by yourself and you're depending on your training and your physical ability and obviously your verbal judo and learning how to talk to people and controlling the room and and all these other different things, whereas in the Marine Corps, they're like, kick the fucking door down. You kick the fucking door down. They tell you to go in, you go in. You're just basically following orders all day long. And now there's no micromanaging. You know, you're kind of your own, your own person. You're making a decision on your own and you're calling a supervisor. You know, a supervisor needs to be called. But other than that, you're kind of doing everything on your own. So, uh, you know, obviously this is uh, back in 2016 where I, I went into the police academy and I graduate seven months later and I went to the first precinct to start off on our two tour uh, patrol. And, you know, I'm just going around and the interactions that I'm having with the people, I was like, dude, this is awesome. I love this job. You know, I was working in, in an area where it was pretty busy and the call volume was high and we're going from call to call to call. And I remember getting out of the car one time and there was a group of, uh, of gang members, you know, that I was told at the time there were gang members and I get out of the car and it was a shooting. So we're just investigating. And one of the guys looks at me and he goes, He's like, you're the guy with the legs. And I go, what do you mean? And I go, uh, what do you mean? He's like, you're the guy with the legs. I'm like, and then at that point, I knew he knew who I was. So I was like, oh, I'm the guy without the legs. Yeah, what's up, man? How are you? So he starts laughing. I start laughing. The guys start laughing. And it kind of broke the ice of this whole, like, you know, you're new. And, and then they knew me. I was like, man, these people know who I am right now. And they came up and they gave me a handshake. And, you know, they thanked me for my service. I was like, this is pretty badass. You know, I wasn't expecting that from the community. But because of my circumstance, I was all over, you know, Channel 12 News and Fox 5 News and CNN and whatever, just kind of saying, hey, our, our country's first double amputee. So now that was pretty interesting that, you know, people recognized me and I was I was given a platform to hopefully make a difference and show, um, you know, society, our community and just other people with disabilities that, hey, the job is still possible. Um, you know, you just have to figure out a way how to get it done. So I'm just, I was grateful for my department, you know, to give me the opportunity to to show them that I was able to do the job. And really, you know, my colleagues trust me because, you know, looking at, at it from their, their view, it's, it's like, hey, what, what's going to happen if, you know, one of his prosthetics break? Or what's going to happen if, you know, we have to take off running, you know, running after another guy or jumping a fence? Is he going to be able to do these things? And of course, every time I was met with one of these obstacles, I showed him, hey, we're going to figure it out some one way or another. And, um, you know, now this is a couple of years later and, and I, I moved to our community relation bureau working with, uh, with our our precinct uh, command. And then I was there for a little bit of time. And my uh, lieutenant at the time, uh, who was at, at the academy, reached out and goes, listen, we have an opening at the academy. Uh, we're not sure if you're interested in it. It's Monday to Friday. Weekends off. It's, it's good for, you know, families and whatnot. And we, we'd love to have you here as a drill instructor, you know, with your military background and, and being a bilingual officer. We think you can help out a lot with everything else that goes on in the academy. And, uh, and I just remember coming home and thinking about it. And I was like, you know, why not? Why not give it a shot? You know, I really hated that place when I was there as a recruit, but I'm hoping it's different as a cop. So uh, I went there about three years ago now, and I've been there ever since. And now I'm working with our recruit training section, basically pushing all the recruits through. And um, it's, it's honestly been a privilege to see these young men and women come through and have the aspirations that I once had to come in through a department and learn a new job, learn a new career, give back to our community. And, um, and, you know, now I get to have a little bit of my footprint uh, in their career. And it's really, uh, it's really an honor. You know, I know they don't realize it in the beginning, but uh, it really is like a give and take of energy. So 
that's pretty much it. You know, I, I know it's, uh, it's, it, I'm kind of watering it down and there's been many instances and other stories, but uh, honestly, it's just been a really cool ride so far. And, you know, I'm, I'm entering my seventh year and I'm hoping that, you know, I keep it going strong. It's a pretty good fucking story, dude. I appreciate it, man. There's a lot of stuff that I need to fill in the gaps a little bit here. I'm about 15 fucking questions I wrote down. <laughs> good. I'm glad questions are good. Maybe I'll start off by saying this and you hear it all the time, but I'd be amiss if I didn't say it, but, uh, you know, I appreciate it, dude. Like, you know, the sacrifice, I don't know what it is. I didn't go out there and I, uh, really have a lot of compassion and a lot of empathy for the men and women who, you know, people don't realize the sacrifice that goes into, let's not even talk about becoming a w, double amputee. Let's talk about the sacrifice of leaving your life for nine months, three years, and then returning back and the world's completely different. Um, you know, there's nothing romantic about that shit. And I'm sure you fucking figured it out when you were there. And I hear a thing constantly amongst people who went to war is like the best and worst times of my life. It seems to be like something that you can only understand if you were there. And, you know, I, again, I don't wish it on anybody. And I hope that, you know, the world stays as peaceful as possible, but, you know, thank you for your service, dude. I don't know what else to say. And uh, as genuine as I can make it, I really mean it. I, mean, I think when people mean it, or when people say it, they really mean it too. So um, that's what I'm going to start with. But you know, we had a lot of media coverage. When did they find out? So let me go, actually, let me back up a little bit. Do you think the agency liked the idea that you were a double amputee and that's why they give you a shot? Why do you think they chose you? Do you think they, you think there was some, some kind of, they really wanted to give you it? Like, tell me what you thought about that. You ever find out things later on? Did they, did they ever like say, well, I don't know if we could take this guy or they're like, Hey, let's give this motherfucker a shot. What was it like? I mean, I've heard it from both ends. You know, I've heard it from my command staff and I've heard it from, you know, the precinct level, the precinct level was like, Oh man, like, What's going to happen? You know, is he going to be able to do the job? Are they just going to kind of push him through regardless of the situation and, you know, and, and whatnot? And uh, now being at that place, you know, and working at the uh, the academy, I've heard, you know, nothing but great things that they were, you know, super motivated to see me go through it. And they saw that I was physically and, 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 and mentally capable of, of handling the job. And, um, you know, I've never heard anybody say um, that we shouldn't have gave you a chance. A lot, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm glad we did. And we just never done it before. So that, I think that was kind of like a, a trial to see what's going on. Now, I haven't heard of anybody coming through again in my department, at least um, as an amputee. But I can say that there's two of my friends um, that have gone through the police uh, academy as a double amputee. And they're both on my softball team. Uh, one is Zach, and he, he's working in Texas. Um, he's a double amputee Marine uh, who also went through a couple of years after I did. And recently, uh, my buddy Brent went through the police academy in upstate New York where he was a single below the knee uh, army veteran and had complications with the other leg. And so they had to amputate that one too. So now he's a double and he's the third uh, double amputee from my understanding to go through. So, you know, I think, I think to be honest with you, the job just looked at it and said, you know, if he's got all his ducks in a row, you know, and he's able to do it, why not? And, um, and again, I've, I've had the, the pleasure to meet all of my higher ups and all sorts of people in the department and they've been nothing but positive about it. And, you know, kind of hoping that everything goes well from, from the get go. When did the media start getting involved when they started, who, who alerted them and let them know that we had this going on Was your agency or the people letting them know? Uh, I think it was my agency towards the end. You know, um, they like to do a good job at, at highlighting people who've gone through adversity um, and, 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 and whatnot in the past life. And now they want to kind of highlight, uh, you know, of course they asked me if it would be all right. And to me, I was like, well, this is kind of the reason why I'm doing it. You know, I want, I want other veterans. I want other people that are in my circumstance to know that there is a shot that you could take it, you know, and hopefully that, you know, your department will just be as, as uh, accommodating as mine has been, you know, because the first thing they asked me when I got there is like, Hey, do you need anything, you know, any kind of accom accommodations or whatever? I was like, not really. I mean, I drive my car the same way I would drive a police car. I um, essentially kind of have a joke that, you know, mostly everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. Well, my legs are already attached to the pants. So that kind of gives me a one up on people. It saves me a little time. Um, but I, I pretty much did everything else that everybody else did. So I wouldn't really need uh, anything special. So I think that the job really appreciated that. They were like, hey, listen, this guy's not asking for anything. Why don't we give him the shot? And so once we were getting to the end of the program and they were they, they were able to see that, you know, I was able to keep up with the fist man suit and uh, the PT portion, the DT portion and everything else. And they were like, hey, that's pretty badass. You know, we want to highlight that. And 
um, and, and obviously with your, your permission. And so I think that's kind of where it kicked off. The world is a harsh place. And I say that to preface my next question. Have you ever felt animosity from other coworkers of yours because maybe they thought you received special treatment or the attention you got and there was jealousy? You know, I haven't really felt that. I've had nothing but support from my uh, my classmates. I mean, I I felt bad. The day that we graduated, I felt like, you know what, they're taking away from my classmates because now instead of, you know, whatever it was, 90-something recruits graduating, I felt like the spotlight was on me. You know, and I understand that my story is unique and it's different, but those other guys put, you know, they put, they put, they put in the work, they busted their ass and they reserved the same uh, the does deserve the same recognition that I did. So every time that I've sat down with a beer or, or dinner or, you know, meet up with all these guys, they're like, Maddie, don't ever think that way. You know, we're super extremely grateful that you were here and part of this with us. And, you know, we're, we're really happy that you're out there doing a good job. So I've had nothing but, you know, positivity come out of it. And not to mention a lot of people reaching out when they had something going on uh, with somebody they may have known and kind of put me on that, you know, on that path of, Hey, can you reach out to this person, you know, and, and, and see if you can help out. I imagine that the recognition maybe nationally has died down a little bit, you know, and I'm sure that people still hear about you before they go to the academy. Hey, we got a drill instructor. He's a double amputee. And I don't know what your reputation is as a drill instructor. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means to be a drill instructor and the impact you can have on somebody. And I'm curious how you guys are doing things there uh, off the topic of you being a double amputee, but you know, once that recognition has died down, this kind of similar thing that happens with cops who are shot in the line of duty. You'll hear them say, uh, you know, we we uh, you know, we go through this whole thing. We're like these heroes. We're being honored. We're given all this stuff. People are taking care of us. And then it just goes away. And people, my friends, my family, my coworkers, it just all seems to disappear. Did you feel any of that? You know, once the stuff started dying down? No, not at all. You know, I'm actually kind of happy it died down a little bit. Um, I, I just wanted to go to work and you know, yeah. I just wanted to show up to work and I wanted to hang out with the guys, the girls and just answer my calls and, and you know, go to work, have a good time and go home. And, um, you know, with a little bit of time for, from time to time, when I meet new new officers or new recruits and they tell me that they hear about my story, you know, they they obviously uh, show their their gratitude and, and so on and so forth. And then I'm just mad. You know, that's that's all it is. Hey, Matt, you know, did this or Matt did that. Uh, Matt's doing jujitsu or Matt's, you know, whatever. And uh, really they try to use my story to hopefully um, really disable any kind of thoughts from other people that they can't do something. So anytime they're looking for a little motivation, I try to kind of step up and, and, and help out. But for the most part, like I said, I just like to be, I like being the general population, you know, I like to be like everybody else. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's not the case because of my story. Uh, but for the most part, my, my coworkers treat me like just a regular guy. What are some of the things that you live with today? Like, Physical pain, discomfort. Uh, you know who Nick Lavery is? Nick Lavery. Sounds familiar. Yes. Nick is a the only guy in special forces that is a single leg amputee returned to special forces. Right. Yes, prosthetic. above the knee. Yeah, I think he's above the knee, correct? I think the whole fucking leg, dude, right? Yeah. Above I think, the, uh, yeah, I think it's he's, above the he's knee. He's above the knee. Yeah, he's above the knee for sure. I remember uh, seeing the bad picture, right? Bro. Is, yeah. is it like there's a picture like facing up towards him? You know, or something like that, and he's got his gear on or whatever. I, I think I've seen that circulate. I don't know, dude, but Nick's been on the podcast. He's a friend of the company and the show. Awesome. He's a bad motherfucker, bro. He's like six seven. Yeah, like six, seven, sixty-five then. shredded yeah. fucking wheat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like the dude's a fucking dude. savage. Um it's awesome. Yeah, he's a cool dude. So he tells us about things that uh, probably ninety-nine point nine 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 percent of people have no idea that you guys deal with. And that's like his brain still thinks his legs there. And he has like shit like that happening that was really uncomfortable. What are some of the things you're dealing with and some limitations that you do have? So what Nick is talking about, um, a lot of people call it a uh, phantom phantom like phantom like yeah, so, yeah. so so phantom leg pain, phantom pain. What happens is when the injury happens, and if it's dramatic, if it's dramatic enough uh, injury, obviously everything's still trying to fire off. So your nerves, your 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 veins, everything's still trying to trying to work, but it's not there. So in the beginning, you know, you try to get out of bed and you try to step there and it's not there. So you, you've lived your life, especially happened, you know, in your in your youth or, or you know, somewhere in your, your teenage years. And now you're trying to live the life that you had once before and it's not there. So that's kind of what that phantom thing's all about. Um, for me, people don't know how to differentiate the difference between phantom uh, pain and nerve damage. You know, a lot of it is nerve damage because the nerves in the, in the leg or the body or the arm or whatever that you lost or injured um, is still there. 
you know, so you kind of got to get through that uh, with, with time. And eventually, you know, after you spend a couple of years, uh, it starts to go away a little bit. But there are times where your leg just starts spazzing at times uh, because of the wear and, and tear of the prosthetic. Um, my biggest thing is because I am a below the knee amputee, um, you know, the, the prosthetic is digging into the back of the calf or the back of the knee. Um, so you build folliculitis, which is, you know, ingrown hairs and the ingrown hairs start becoming very painful behind the leg and they get swollen and, you know, and it can get affected if you don't take care of it and, uh, and do enough good hygiene. So I think the biggest thing that I have going for me, um, is the sweating, man. You know, you're putting on, uh, you're putting this polyurethane or, or this rubber piece, which is called a liner over the residual. And now because of the movement of the leg and the in and out of the car and sitting in the chair and standing up or doing PT or whatever, it's causing it to sweat. And it's very difficult to, you know, just take your leg off every hour to, to wipe it off, which is essentially what you're supposed to do. But I kind of rock through it. You know, I'm in what's called a pin lock system. So uh, that liner does have a pin on the bottom of it and it actually connects to the prosthetic. So you can't pull it off, um, which is kind of like a safety thing for me, especially in law enforcement. But, you know, I think that would probably be one of the biggest complications for me is the sweating, but I've learned to deal with it and I kind of manage it pretty well. Um, and again, being just getting used to it because I've been an amputee for 12 years now. Um, another thing that kind of, you know, it takes your time a little bit, uh, not as much, but I'm a little bit more aggressive. Like for example, if I have to go to the prone or if I got to go to the kneeling position for me, it's like, boom, there is no like one speed where you slow down. I just throw my body down. Cause number one, you want to move with intensity, but number two, um, I don't have the ankle flexion of moving my foot down and lowering my weight at, at, at a, a certain speed. It's just like zero to a hundred for me. So I just drop down to a knee and I get down. Um, so I know that's kind of like something that's been frustrating uh, because I remember what it's like, you know, but if I didn't know what it was like, it wouldn't really bother me. So that's, uh, that's another thing. But other than that, you know, I've, I've climbed a, a few fences. I've been on a couple of foot pursuits um, and I haven't had any issues there. So, you know, I, re I really just think the, the sweating is probably the biggest complication I have. Do you ever get down about your situation? Like, does it ever bring you down? Were there moments going through this? You're like, this fucking sucks, dude. Or it felt like any kind of depression surrounding it? The depression, no, because I think that I, I my story is a little bit different. Um, I, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that I talk about is the importance of being approachable in law enforcement uh, and in the military. And I think I learned that in the military. When you go through the shit with your guys uh, in combat and stuff, we talk to each other. We don't really keep it from one another. We learn how to build that camaraderie with one another. And uh, just being able to talk to people has helped me tremendously. I can't even imagine what it was like, you know, if I was dealing with something and not being able to talk to somebody about it. Um, so I think that's kind of set me up for success in the beginning. And now in law enforcement, you know, I've been able to be a part of the peer team um, and also have a lot of the training for mental health aspect uh, and so on and so forth that, you know, I think it's helped me to find the positivity of what happened to me. You know, I have a lot of friends who are kind of like, you know, the special force guy that is missing above the knee. And that's more complicated to deal with than below the knee. And I also have friends who are unable to see because of the uh, result of an injury, you know, an eye injury, or are not able to, you know, hold their wife or their kid's hands because they're missing, you know, their, their hands or their arms. And so I just try to find, you know, the positivity in what happened to me and how I'm able to still, you know, wake up, go to work every single day and put on a pair of jeans and you wouldn't even know, you know, so I, I just try to be positive. And again, I, I do find certain things frustrating, but I wouldn't say it gets me down to the point where I'm depressed or, you know, uh, wanting to end my life or something like that. You know, I, I try to use like my issues as something stupid, you know, as stupid as like, Hey, I can't get as low as I want to when I squat or I can't do lunges so comfortably, you know, but then I find another way to do it. You know, instead of using the free weights, I'll get on the Smith machine instead of doing, you know, uh, lunges i'll do it on the on the bench or whatever you know it's just really adapting overcoming your injury any pain still to this day um yeah there's times where you know my legs again it gets swollen from just the wear and tear or uh, i train a lot man i train jujitsu at four o'clock in the morning and then i'll do a, a workout right after work and i'll go for a bike ride or whatever and, and at times you know I, I either a i forget or b i'm just naive you know that it's even happening um and i guess you get so used to the pain you just kind of push through it. And at night, you'll take a shower, you'll take a bath, you'll get in bed and you'll go, damn, I'm kind of sore a little bit. But then you ask the guys, who, you know, have both legs and both thumbs. And they're like, fuck, I'm sore today, too. You know, so you're, you're not any different than anybody else. You're just kind of dealing with your own situation. You know, 
Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast, and it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally, and we also entertain you as well. What about your family life? Married, kids? So... I'm getting married in, uh, let's see, probably like two weeks. Oh, getting shit. Mar- getting married in two weeks uh, to my fiance, Megan. Um, I, have a, I have a daughter. I have an eight-year-old daughter, Tiana, who is, man, she's like a replica of me. Um, she's from a, a previous marriage. And, uh, you know, my guys like to mess around and go, are you really a veteran if you didn't get divorced? Um, you know, but obviously, was young, did the whole fall in love thing. And, and we had a child very young. And uh, we wanted something different from life. And so we just amicably moved forward and, and, and moved on with our lives. And I knew I wanted to continue to do different things. And it required me to travel and be away from home. And unfortunately, we know that that doesn't really work out very well when you're not present. And, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, bumping of the heads, but uh, we both moved on. And, and I met Megan, who was a nurse, you know, four years ago. And I just saw her and I was like, man, this chick is different, man. She's, that, she's different than any other girl I've ever met. Um, you know, she, we and I, we, we meet at the bar. And uh, we're just kind of bullshit. And it just happened. Everything was just aligned that night, man. I had my, my buddy, Tommy, who was my Navy foreman, the guy who saved my life. He was visiting. I hadn't seen him in a few years. And um, I had just filed for the divorce. And I was going through a hard time, like, you know, understanding what to do with my daughter. She was young. And so he came up and I had friends and we had a little get together. We went out to a local bar and uh, we're all kind of hanging out. And there's a group of girls. And then there's my group of cops and Marines. And the girls start mixing in. And I'm here holding two cranberry vodkas. And this girl comes up to me in a bandana and a shirt that says body by pizza, you know, ripped up jeans, Tom's super laid back. She's like, uh, those are kind of girly drinks for you, aren't they? And I just kind of giggle. I'm like, ah, one of these aren't mine. And so Tommy being as drunk as he is, um, he comes up and he, uh, he goes, Hey, you watch how you fucking talk to my friend. He's an American hero. You know? And I'm like, all right, you're all right, Tommy. And she's like, he's like, he's missing both his legs. And she's like, what? You're missing both your legs. And she's like, let me see. So I pull up one of my pant legs and I have like these American flag uh, prosthetics. And she's like, oh, cool. And I'm like, this chick has to be either a nurse or a cop or a veteran because nobody just looks at that and goes, oh, cool. You know, like not even phasing it. And she's like, thank you for your service. It means a lot. You know, I had some family in the military and I'm a nurse. And I was like, fucking knew it. You know, so she's been a nurse for about 12 years and um, we just clicked, you know, just our perspectives in life and what we want out of it and the positivity and our personalities are, you know, really just, um, surrounding ourselves around family and, and good things. And, uh, and yeah, it's been a really cool ride, man. She actually just up uh, to do something. I don't know what she's doing, but we've been doing all the wedding planning and uh, we're really looking forward to it and hopefully expanding our family and, and so on. Yeah, I'll be there in two weeks. Do more. I got the, uh, I'll get the hey, invite tomorrow. Listen, man, I will text it to you right now. As a matter of fact, we're doing the courtroom wedding in two weeks and in four weeks we're getting married in Mexico. So I'll send you the invite. Come on by. It'll be a vacation for you. Fuck dude. You know what? I, uh, I wish I could brother. And, uh, but I, well, I want to tell you the first thing I'm afraid to go to Mexico. Here's why uh, it's been, it's been I run a, little... a police training company that, uh, teaches cops how to stop the cartels. All right. So I've been told from our cartel teacher that it's probably not a good idea to go to Mexico ever again in your life. <laughs> So I can almost guarantee you that you're not going to find me in Mexico ever again in my life. Listen, I'll FaceTime you, all right? Yeah, appreciate it, dude. Uh, At the altar, make the fucking deacon or the priest hold it. I want to see the whole thing, Matt. That's it. It'll be live, bro. It'll be live. But could you imagine a cop and a nurse? No shit. It's unheard of. It's typical. Yeah, it's typical. It's either a nurse, cop, teacher, cop, cop, you know, teacher, fireman. It's kind of like that thing, especially in the tri-state area. You know, it's just the way it works. And I would have never thought of it, but it. It kind of works. You know, when I met her, I was on the midnights and she's on the midnights, you know, so we just kind of clicked that we understood it. We understood the hours. We understood, you know, the separation and the days without seeing each other. And, you know, she's running around like a maniac. So she's not really able to answer the phone and we're doing what we're doing. So it just kind of worked out, you know. What's the blessing in disguise out of this whole thing? What is the upside to losing your legs? As crazy as that sounds, you probably have a good answer for that. So we can either be sarcastic about it or we can be serious about it. The sarcasm is that I'm going to write a book and I'm going to write all the reasons why missing your legs is better than having your legs. Um, some examples are, you know, not ever having to clip my toenails again. That's a pretty good one. That's good. Um, stubbing the toe on the bed. That's a pretty good one. I've done that a few times. Um, there have been many times where I'm around the pool deck where the pool deck's too hot. 
and I'm just sitting there walking around and, you know, everybody else is complaining about how hot it is. The water, you know, when you first get into the water at the beach and it's fucking freezing and I walk in and I just start like, oh my God, you know, they all just kind of like realize it takes them a second because people forget, you know, you can be looking at it and if you've been around me long enough, you'll realize like, damn, this guy is fucking with me right now, you know, because I'm sitting <laughs> like tippy toeing through the water. But there's always a, there's always good ways to look at it. You know, there's always a positive side. And like I said, listen, I'm not trying to be an asshole and, and paint a picture that's not real. You know, there are times where it sucks. Like I said, the sweating and you have to slow down, you have to take your leg off, wipe your leg, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's, it's nothing that you can't handle. So the positive of the blessing of this guy is, is that when I was trying with the softball team, um, we started meeting a lot of kids that were coming to these games uh, because they heard about the local town heroes playing softball, come out and watch them. And so back when we started the team in 2012, we were getting like one or two kids and we'd make them the bat boy or the bat girl and kind of let them hang out. And being 22, 23 years old at the time, man, I don't think you realize, you know, and not being a parent yet, and you don't realize what these kids really mean to you, you know, what they're doing there, being the bat boy, being the bat girl. And a couple of years in, I, I hang out with this kid and I, I urge you, you know, to write this name down, Landis Sims. Landis Sims is now like 16 years old. I've known him since he was like six. He was born with a rare congenital disease and he's missing both arms and both legs. And the kid wants to be a baseball player. When, I'm, when I say he's a good baseball player, I mean, he's a damn good baseball player. Um, and we're at a camp one year and he tells me, I've never felt comfortable in my whatever years it was, like eight, nine years old he was. I've never in my life felt comfortable wearing shorts until I met you guys. And that fucking hit me in the chest like you, like with a sledgehammer, you know, because I felt that I felt that in his eyes that he was like, I'm embarrassed to wear shorts. I'm embarrassed for people to see me this way. And now he's looking at like 20 guys who are all, you know, infantry guys and uh, engineers and EOD techs and doing all this badass stuff. And we're giving these kids like somebody to look up to. And as much as we try to be role models to our kids, if they don't see somebody that looks like them, then they can't really quite relate. And um, these kids really set the tone, man, for being uh, a good example and being a leader and being a role model for them. So the blessing has been that I've been able to have a platform to talk to numerous organizations, be a part of numerous organizations, uh, be the spokesperson for organizations uh, to try to you know promote good you know mental health, good physical health, um, good camaraderie within law enforcement, military, and just you know bring positivity to the table in a world where you know the negativity just can't hide. It just seems like negativity is hitting us from every single direction, whether it's financial, medical, emotional, you know whatever, whatever it may be. So I just try to leave this house every day and. I just try to impact one person and give them a little bit of hope that, you know, whatever they're going through that day, it's going to be all right. So I just feel like God blessed me with a story and I'm not just like everybody else um, in a sense of, you know, going out and, and living my life. When I wear shorts, people just look at you different. You know, I rarely ever park in a handicapped spot. I'm going to tell you this. And I don't know why it just kind of gives me like this feeling that, you know, give it to somebody else who's, you know, who needs it. And there have been times where I get out of a handicapped parking spot with jeans on and people just kind of like squint at me and look at me funny, you know, and then I'll get out of the car with shorts and people are like, thank you for your service and da da da. And I, I just think it's all about perspective. And, you know, people don't realize it. Half the time that I'm walking with some of my boys, half of them have done six, seven, eight tours to Iraq, Afghanistan, have been hit with shrapnel, have been, you know, hit with all sorts of stuff. They're dealing with PTSD and they don't see it. So they'll tell me, thank you for your service. But the guy who's next to me, who's done so much more, you know, doesn't even get recognition. So um, I just try to really just spread a lot of, you know, good, positive energy, man. That's that's really it. Shifting gears a little bit. Uh, you're obviously a drill instructor now, and that means more than just being a drill instructor, especially at a police academy. <clears throat> what does it mean to you to be a, an instructor at the academy now? You know, I think that that this modern society, the, the kids that are coming in now, they're just being um, raised a little different. You know, they have the social media, they have uh, a lot of distractions. You know, they don't really have what we had when we were, you know, growing up. They didn't have the whole, you know, Johnny, come inside, it's time to eat dinner. You know, like we're outside playing. I was just talking this conversation out there with one of my buddies. We play football for like nine hours outside. We come in with holes in our pants and mud up to our necks. You know, injuries like little scrapes and bruises and whatever else. And, you know, we come and wash our hands and eat dinner. You know, we're not getting off the, you know, we're not getting up until everybody's done eating. 
We help mom and dad wash the dishes. We take the trash out. We do chores. And I even see it with my daughter. And I think I'm treating my daughter that way too, where you kind of want to give them this comfort blanket, you know, the safety blanket that they don't have to go through the things that, that we went through. So the reason that I felt like, you know, the opportunity to go to the academy was a good one was that I was hoping that I'm 34 years old. I'm not old by any means, but because I got injured at such a young age and I've been in the military since I was 18 years old, I feel like I had a different, you know, a different upbringing than most of these guys. And by me able to set this tone for them and hopefully give them this, you know, live, you know, image that, hey, anything's possible. I felt like, hey, you know what? I can give them this. You're going to go through hurdles in life. You're going to go through injuries. You're going to go through maybe a divorce, God forbid. You're going to go through loss of life. You're going to see a lot of shit in the police world that you're not really prepared to see, you know, because a six month, seven month academy to me, like, doesn't mean that you're going to be the best cop in the world. You know, you still have field training. You still have probation. You still have all the stuff you got to kind of get through in the first couple of years of your life. And I want them to leave as good human beings. And I want them to leave as good people. And, you know, because of the training that we give them, I'm hoping that they're going to stay safe. But at the end of the day, you know, it's going to it's going to require some energy from them, you know, to be good human beings, to learn how to talk to people, to learn how to treat people with dignity, to, you know, just be a good person. Because that to me is what being a good cop, man, you're going to have fucking 30 years. You have 30 years to learn the job. You know, if you don't know how to do the job in the first five, 10 years, then obviously maybe the job is not for you. But if we can give them a little piece of us to be good people, to give you know them the time of day and to treat the people they're going to be responding with with respect, then I think that you know we've done a pretty good job. Big responsibility to be a trainer for recruits. What are some things that you guys are doing to implement some new shit and get and kick some of the old shit? Because we know, no offense to the drill instructor I'm talking to at a police academy, the old shit don't work, All right? So, you know, you're in a position now to have some significant change. You can impact it. One of the most recent stories that I'm very proud of is a gentleman in this state who went against the grain and started taking the advice of the things that we put out and actually changed the program, uh, unbeknownst to the command staff. And they were fucking livid with him and his recruits couldn't praise him enough. So sometimes we got to push that edge. You know, we've got to push ourselves into that uncomfortable area to know that we have to make change for the better, even if it's to the detriment of our command staff or our bosses, where they're saying, that's not in the program. See, we can't follow the program anymore. It hasn't worked. It's not working. And we've got to change the dynamic in this profession where everybody's told before they get to go to the academy. Matt, what do you think everybody's told before they go to the academy? What were you told before you went to the academy? Do you remember? You're going to the know, academy. Just, what, do guys, what do guys tell you? I mean, to be honest with you, just keep your head down kind of thing, you know? Right. But that's even that's even part of what the whole thing is, is everybody's told the same thing. I was told by my whole command staff at three different agencies because I went to three different academies. You go to the academy, you're not going to learn a thing. Uh, so don't worry about whatever happens there. You're not going to learn shit. And you know what? None of them lied to me. They were all 100% correct. I went to three police academies and learned almost nothing. So I spent 77 weeks in academies and came out with pretty much nothing. Uh, a few little nuggets from some people who, you know, just pranced in here and there that were uh, just those people that you don't forget because they did such a good job. And in three academies, I could probably name five of them out of the probably 150 instructors that I had, maybe five to seven that actually had an impact. And I heard some of the things they said. So, you know, we have to start having this conversation. Now, again, I didn't know you were at the academy, but you're now you're in my territory a little bit. And, you know, I want to encourage you to try to push the envelope of change if you have the opportunity to do so. And look at some of the things that we're implementing or suggesting that are done that are people that are actually having real impact for cops on the street. So it was really, really, dude, that guy wrote that to me. And we had a nice conversation about it via like Facebook Messenger. Uh, he sent me pictures of what it looked like, what they were doing, what he got rid of, what he implemented. Um, and dude, it like made my heart warm because I don't want the recognition. I just want the fucking change. So I say that to you as a friend moving forward and as a guy who runs a police training company, um, you know, that like when it's a guy who's 34 and you know, although you can feel like you're a Gen Xer, we're really not. We're uh, we're kind of more millennials, you and I. I mean, I'm on the borderline. I'm 41 going on 42. 
there's a real opportunity there. You know, I wanted to just give that gift to you. And, and I think that you're probably the right guy to make that shit happen. Have you ever followed any of our stuff? Do you, do you know anything about our company at all? I don't, to be honest with you, I don't, I, I, you know, I got the, I got the email and like I said, you know, I I was told, uh, Hey man, give this guy, give this guy a holler and uh, you could definitely learn from him. You know, and here we are a couple of weeks later. Well, we've been trying to make this happen for a while now, but um, you know, to be honest with you, I, I always like to meet, I'm a big proponent of this whole, Hey, you know, you got to see it for yourself, you know, because like, you know, people tell you stories and they do this and do that. And then it's, it's not what it, what it's, you know, really turns out to be. So for me, I was like, hey, I go into it with an open mind and I like meeting people. I like meeting new people. I like hearing theories, stories and kind of getting it from themselves. And energy to me is a big thing, man. I love energy. Like if you bring energy to the table, like it it sparks my interest immediately, you know, and that's kind of what I was looking for to see what it's all about. Who told you about me and what did they say? I'm curious. You know, it's a good (laughs) question. I'm not gonna lie to you. I have no idea. I can't remember right now. I'll have to go back. I'll definitely let you know. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing. No, it was a good thing. Definitely a good thing, um, which is why we're on the podcast now. You know, um, we have a lot forward. of guys, right? So there's a handful of Suffolk and Nassau guys that are big subscribers to the Street Cop podcast and and to Street Cop training in general before the podcast even started. And I know that they're getting a lot of pushback in that area because they're doing police work. And, you know, I, I, I hear the stories. They send they send messages to me. That you know they don't do that kind of shit around here, and that's not how this place works. But there are great men and women in those agencies that are out there trying to make the change. And I think, you know, you're probably the right guy for it, dude. And I think we all come together for a fucking reason. And man, I would encourage you to peruse through some of our stuff on Instagram and and all our social media channels and check out our TikToks and stuff like that because it's not me just dancing on TikTok. There's we just actually did a fucking TikTok before on five things academies can do to improve. Uh, recruit training. So we're not saying you need to improve. Go figure it out. We're saying you need to improve. We got to fix this shit. Uh, here's some suggestions. Yeah. So no, I'll tell you this. I, 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 I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I, like I said, I've been there for three years. So I'm, I, I'd like to consider three years pretty new. Um, the people that are there, the people that are running the place are actually open-minded. You know, believe it or not, they're pretty right. open-minded. Um, there's been a lot of change in the program in the last couple of years, you know, with the BCPO and all that other stuff, uh, the DT program, I mean, just kind of adapting to all this stuff. And I I just think it's awesome. Um, you know, that we have the people that are teaching the program kind of have a background in whatever they're teaching. You know, we have, you know, attorneys teaching law, we have uh, black belts in jujitsu teaching DT. We have people who have run marathons and half marathons and, you know, compete in different levels, teaching PT, you know, so it is pretty cool to see Good that. Shit, we, have a, dude. Yeah. We, we have a pretty, uh, we have a pretty young, um, young staff and the people that are in the forties and fifties, you wouldn't even believe their age. You know, I, I got to give a shout out to one of my fellow instructors and uh, who was my instructor. His name is Greg. And Greg was there when I was there as an instructor and the guy was chill, laid back. He's not screaming in my ear or anything. And there were times where, you know, I was either, struggling with the run or something and he just there he's like pushing me and motivating me and i'm like how old is this guy you know when somebody told me he was 50 i was like you gotta be fucking kidding me this guy <laughs> yeah. was run. this guy was running he's in great shape he's got the veins popping out good looking guy you know great in uniform and i'm like dude this is kind of like who i want to be you know when i graduate here i want to stay in shape i want to do a good job i want to make friends i want to have the camaraderie you know i want to go home at the end of the day these are things that are important to me. So I will say that, you know, that I, I don't need to stroke the ego of the people I work with. They all know they're great. They're phenomenal. And um, I just think that they've been doing a good job at adapting to, you know, today's modern problems in policing and policing and, and stuff. But I would definitely love to see your content and, and follow up and uh, and let you know if we are doing any of those things that you're putting out there. Yeah. Anything we can do to support you too, dude. Like we want to see the change, man. I don't want any money for it. I just want it. And dude, honestly, it's a big fucking relief. You actually made my day. By hearing that such a big police academy in Long Island is is implementing change, where right now there is no doubt in my mind I can hear fourteen thousand recruits in the United States right now swing sticks at a bag and screaming "Get back!" Things they'll never do <laughs> ever again in their life. And you don't even got to comment if you guys are still doing that, but like, boy, if there's anything that's dumber in the world than swinging sticks at a bag, I'd love to hear it because uh, I don't know if there is because I've never seen a cop swing a stick at a bag in the street, and I've seen them like swing sticks and fall down. Uh, swing sticks, have the stick taken from them and then having to shoot the guy or, 
them falling over because they think a stick's going to save the day when they're getting their asses kicked. Uh, you know, all those fun things. That these, these men and women think that uh, it's not going to happen to them until it starts to happen to them. So, man, it's a real relief. And, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. And it's cool to hear that there are people that are on the same page with us. And we continue to all work together to make this a better fucking profession and a safer profession, dude. And it means a lot. You know, it's a real big responsibility. Even when I was a field training officer, I mean, I took it so very seriously. I might, We rode two-man cars, right? And, you know, my partner would be like, come on, dude, you're going to fucking leave again for 12 weeks. And I'm like, yeah, dude, we're going to be like, I want to invest in this guy. He's got such potential or this girl. I feel trained men and women and, uh, you know, and given that experience, dude, that like made them love the fucking job. And I watch it now, you know, fucking 10, 15 years later, 20 years later, well, not 20, I would have been in this job 22 years now. You know, I, I, I see them, bro. They're just, they're a different kind of person because of that experience in field training. So, you know, I took it all very seriously and I, I, I want to see the continued change. And, you know, to my detriment at times, I open my mouth and say the things that need to be said. And some people don't like it because it holds them accountable, but it is what it is, man. Do you want change? You want to just sit here and continue to accept what we see on a television of a complete training failure. All we yeah, see over good, and over again. The good thing that, that, uh, that social media does provide is an, uh, a different view. Um, I could tell you that, you know, I don't know uh, what your training background is with any kind of martial uh, mixed martial arts or anything, but um, the jujitsu thing is, is starting to become a very popular thing. And um, and I roll at a, at a gym called Monster here on Long Island. And, you know, one of my instructors is, uh, you know, a, a veteran. Um, he's been on 20 plus years. He's a black belt. And he is pushing that to the extreme, man, is Good. teaching the teaching the Kimuras, teaching the takedowns, teaching you know, how to do weapons handling and stuff. And when we roll at four o'clock in the morning, he's implementing that. And we're not even at work, but the people that go are cops, you know, we'll pack out a room. I'm, I don't know if you follow me on social media, but if you watch uh, my, my social media, we have 36 guys going to a four 30 in the morning class before they go to work at seven and they're all cops, you know, and they want, they want to get better. And, and that's kind of what I, I try to, you know, implement it's like, Hey, stay in shape, train, do something that's going to keep you safe or, you know, keep your partner safe at that. And um, I think that's important. But again, I, I'm so new to the job. You know, I, I have going on seven years. I'm so new to the job, but I have a little bit of time. So I'm in a weird gap, you know, because, again, the way that I that I, what I see right now in my department for what I hear, it's very different. I talked to other guys who are cops throughout the country and they are saying that they are they're having some of these problems that you're bringing up, you know, and then I look at my department and I'm like, am I just not seeing it? Because like my guys are actually doing the stuff that I'm hearing about, you know? So it's like, what, what are we doing that we're not all on the same page? You know? Uh, what we're doing is we're letting egos and non-humility get in the fucking way. That's what's going on. And, and people pushing agendas for their own personal uh, gains. It's a horrible thing, dude. And that's fine in the rest of the world, but in a situation like law enforcement, everybody's got to just throw their fucking swords on the table and hand them in and let us get to where we need to be and continue to progress and change. So we don't continue to face, you know, quote unquote, the problems that we face in America, which oddly enough, I would imagine compared to the rest of the world, we probably have the most highly trained police officers in the world. However, there is still a major, major area for improvement. No question about it. And you got to continue to train. It's like anything else, man. I'm a business owner. I continue to train nonstop. Um, when you asked me before earlier, if I train Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, dude, my kids are on, uh, are in it. I watch it. I watch it with admiration. But I left on a medical injury uh, almost eight years ago. I have, I'm actually probably going to start looking into what I can do next with my knee. Like I'm starting to really put thought into all right, maybe it's time to start really fucking trying to fix this thing as best as I can. Maybe there's new technologies just to get some opinions. I heard the newest Goggins book and he referenced a doctor in New York. I'll probably call that guy um, in Manhattan. And Goggins like said he basically like, saved his knees. So uh, yeah, I, I, I can't do it uh, as much as I want to do it. And that's not an excuse. Um, you know, you can see I'm not a fucking fat, lazy shit. It, but unfortunately I have limitations. Limitations. And that is one of them. Yeah, dude, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, even playing. So like, dude, on the surface, like you said, normal fucking dude, right? You'll see me hop on a fucking like side by side, go cruising. Um, 
hop on a quad. I mean, I don't, I'm not racing quads, just going through the woods and shit. But even if I goof around my kids playing basketball in my driveway, dude, it's a few movements for my knees starting to give out. Like it just literally just locks and, and folds and buckles. I'm like, good. You know, it just reminded at times that when I get that kind of physical, the shit just gives out. It's, it's very interesting. And I'm not trying to sit here and play some fucking like sympathy card. I'm just talking about the limitations of what I can do and why I don't try to do jitsu. But dude, I sit there and I fucking wish if I could have anything back right now is the ability to go do that because I admire it tremendously. And I get my kids' asses out of the goddamn house to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gyms. And dude, we do have a lot of BJJ people on this show. As a matter of fact, that's awesome. Yeah, before we had you on today, we had another guy, um, Nick, aka Turtle, who does a program for cops here in Lawrence, New Jersey, every Wednesday at uh, I think 12 o'clock in the afternoon for free. And that's then awesome. Ellie Alfonso is one of our newer instructors, going to be out in the field soon. She's been 19 years training BJJ. They created a program for cops, they actually put gear on. Awesome. And modified all the moves. And dude, we're gonna do anything we can to support those guys and girls. Uh we awesome. had we had Frankie Frankie Edgar here last week. Uh I don't know if you follow Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and like MMA and UFC, but do you know who Frankie Edgar is? I do. I've seen him on Instagram. Yeah, so he was here last week. He's a we had uh, you know, Ricardo Almeida came in. Um, he's one of the founders, that, believe it or not, of UFC. He's one of the first two guys signed by Dana White. When Dana yeah. White was basically like some dude living out of a car, apparently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, and Ricardo's fucking awesome. We had uh, Tom DeBlass on to blast a bad motherfucker. So we get a lot of these guys on to talk about why it's important for law enforcement to take Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So it's it's a big relief to hear that this stuff is actually getting implemented now. But it's taken guys like you who are the newer generation to do it because you still got these old fucks who are romantic with this idea that we're going to fucking swing sticks at bags and yell, get back or fucking do pain compliance by taking your finger and digging into somebody's knuckle and twisting or pinching the inner thigh, this dumbass shit that never works or, you know, solar plexer fucking strikes. Like it just, it's just so silly. And I used to do no bullshit. 2001 in the Academy. I remember taking this course with this guy, uh, he was our DT instructor, and he's like teaching us, like, take your fucking finger, make a gun, put it under somebody's nose, and lift up, and then like it hurts. And I'm like, you know, we're probably like a long time into the make 16 weeks in the academy, and I'm like, uh, you know, you, you're comfortable enough to talk now. And I'm like, hey, does does this shit actually work? And he's like, <laughs> nah. He, dude, he's like, he's like, nah, nah, it doesn't. And I'm like, why are we doing it? He's like, that's what PTC wants. This is the program, and I'm like, so none of it works. He's like, nah, not really. I'm like, what if a guy like we had a guy in the class. I'm like, what about a guy like him, right? I go behind him and I'm fucking like doing this thing. Like, is it going to work? He's like, nah, it's not going to work. And I'm like, why are we doing it then? Right. I'm asking about the sticks. I'm like, do the sticks work? And they're like, nah, they don't, they don't fucking work. I'm like, why are we doing it? Like, eh, they, every department requires you to carry one of these fucking things. I'm like, why though? Right. Like, and the tasers weren't out then yet. You know, if they were, it was very new early, early days. And, you know, we got to have this discussion. It's great, dude. Yeah, we have a we have a conference coming up, bro. I'd like to invite you to come, man. Um, on me if you're if you're down with that, and if you I don't know who's going to be there, it's a badass fucking lineup, dude. We have over twelve hundred cops signed up already. We'll probably be at like seventeen hundred to two thousand awesome. at that event. Um, it's wild, dude. We got some crazy shit. We'll have uh, Kyle Carpenter. You know, Kyle buddy of mine, of course. He was with uh, he was with me at Walter Reed. Dude, you should fucking tell him. You should come and hang out with him. You know, it's funny because he'll probably hear this and he needs to hear this. But that son of a gun, uh, him and I were hanging out at Walt Reed Army Medical Center. We were going out drinking in Washington, D.C. And, you know, bullshit. I was you would have laughed your ass off because I would park my fucking car in front of the bar and I would just start chucking wheelchairs out of the back of my bed. You know, and it's like Kyle Carpenter, a guy named Todd Love, who's a recon Marine. And my buddy, Justin Gertner, who's missing both legs. And we were just a bunch of freaking toys, you know, put back together, going into the bar and having some fun laughs, you know, and now he's such a popular guy. It's impossible to get in touch with him. Um, you know, but I know he's doing some amazing shit, you know, Kyle Carpenter and, uh, you know, we're extremely proud of him and he's an absolute hero and, and an absolute gentleman. So that'll be, that'd be badass to see him again. You know, well, he's just one of the big We have Rob O'Neill coming. We have Tommy Laren from Fox news coming. That's awesome. Uh, we have three significant sheriffs coming. We have, do you know, uh, you know, Jay Redmond, Jay Redmond, mm. Jason Redmond was a, Navy SEAL who was uh, hit like 11 times with a like whatever kind of gun. Dude, I, I'm like the most non-gun, non-military known motherfucker. I forgot what it's called. Uh, you should look up Jay Redmond's YouTube video that he did. 
Uh, he actually has something that he wrote that hangs at Walter Reed Memorial. Okay. And uh, it's a real cool thing. So check out Jay Redman or Jason Redman. Jay's coming. Uh, we have, you know, Cody Alfred is. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Check out Cody Alfred's Instagram. He's legit too, bro. Uh, Cody's become like a real good friend of mine. And I don't want to misquote oh, what course. his comment. Yeah, of course. Jason read me. Yeah, I've, I've met him a few times. I, I'm fucking horrible yeah. with names. You know, that's a bad part about being in the military and law enforcement. You see last names on the plates, you know, on their chest, and that's it. And you don't remember names at all. I'll never forget a face, but the names, I'm, I'm shot. Bro, come to the event. If you can get down there, I'll have a room for you. I got a ticket for you. You can bring your fucking wife. You can bring one of your friends. Bro, it's legit. It's in Nashville, bro. Like, come on. Okay. It's, it's awesome. Nashville. It's April 23rd awesome. to the 28th. And uh, if you can make it, bro, let's set it up. I'll get you. I'll, I'll make sure that Frankie sends you my cell phone number. Okay. And so you can have it. And anything you need from us as far as resources for, you know, your police academy, anything you see that you think is good for us, any training you want to come to, let me know because I want you to come as a liaison, maybe you and another academy staff to come and just see it. Anything you want from our 45 instructors and say, okay, we're going to take some of this shit and start implementing it back into our police academy. There's some real good stuff, dude. And we're not far from you. The only thing is you got to fight the fucking bullshit Long Island traffic to get out to Jersey, which, you know, is fucking ridiculous. It's all right, man. All good. I'll, I'll make the trip for sure. Yeah. So anyway, um, man, it's a pleasure meeting you, dude. And, Absolute um, pleasure, man. I appreciate the time. It really means a lot. You know, it's good to see that, you know, people are very passionate about what they're doing and the people they're, you know, kind of representing because that's a big deal. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know, you know, what you're doing and your program and the people behind it, man. I fucking hope you make it to the conference. Let me talk to your wife. Is she there? I'll do my best. She already walked out, but I'll definitely let her know. Come Listen, on, man. Back. I'm going to fucking talk to her. I'm going to make sure you go. Hey, I'll FaceTime you later. All right. All right, dude. You could ask. I'll, I'll ask for permission. Yeah, yeah. Face. I'll put the pressure on. I'm good at this That's shit. It. That's it. I'll be like, yo, we need him. You got to understand that she'll we go, need this dude. She'll go, she'll go honeymoon or Nashville police conference. I'm like, wait, well, wait. When are you guys going to your honeymoon? What's the days on? Uh, well, we're doing, we're doing, uh, we're doing the wedding in March, so we'll be, we'll be staying in Mexico for a little while, which you're, you know, kind of uh, exiled from coming to. Yeah, yeah, but dude, you still come April 23rd to the 28th, bro. Get the fucking pass from work. It's right, a training it. event. We have a. Dude, you got to check out our calendar. Check out streetcop.com and look at the fucking itinerary on it. It's legit. Okay. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot of cool shit there, and and dude, we'll sell that. Tell her to come. It's fucking Nashville, bro. Awesome. Tell her make right. a trip for her too. Put her fucking her. boots and hat on and go out and do a honky tonk while we fucking That's it. do some cool shit. That's awesome. All right. All right, brother. It's nice meeting you, dude. I'll send you my hey, fucking number. Very nice to meet you, brother. I appreciate the time. All right, Matt. Thanks, dude. Later. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.